Bem, bom dia a todos. Good yeah. morning, everyone. We're here, very proud to be here in order to launch the book, The Work Manifesto, Democratizing, Decommodifying and Remedying. This book is a result of the University of Fortaleza Law School program and the Ouro Preto University program and it was funded by CAPES and it brings up the discussion of the reality of the workplace in the Brazilian context. So we're going to start our meeting with the co-authors with an address of our coordinator from Unifor, Professor Zina Pompeo. Good morning, good morning. Professor Ana Virginia, good morning, everyone. This very beautiful network that today makes this dream a reality, this reality of collective work in favor and to advocate for the dignity of the work that has to be reconstructed and that is able to conciliate the planet, profits, people, and above all in a modern version in favor of rethinking in times of pandemic when we use all mechanisms that sometimes hurt basic structures. So on behalf of the University of Fortaleza, I would like to thank Professor Ana Virginia Gomes and Professor Eduardo Rocha Dias for being part of this center that brings together research and impact and that unfolds very well together with MECTIS, that is our research group in law and public security, that unfolds this congregation at the local, national and international level because rethinking the work relations is an essential task. And it's always necessary either at the master's level or the PhD level so that you are the ones that can make society change. So before I was very happy yesterday here in the University of Fortaleza to know that Professor Ana Virginia Gomez works in partnership with the Secretariat of the Municipality, the Secretariat of Work and the Environment, she was able to make this uh, project of bursaries for the recyclers of solid wastes. So I would like to give you my testimony here. So there is a relevance, a substantial work of everyone in favor of dignity of work. So along these lines, the PPG Unifor and the University of Fortaleza, it's together with you. We stand together with all the colleagues here. I see Sebastian Perez that is representing the male ale here, but also the warriors, females here, so that they are also recognized and acknowledged as the Pandora's box, as we say. So we hope that uh, hope itself is unleashed after so many hardships, so much hardship we've gone through 2020, 2021, so that we can overcome it, overcome the hardship of the hard work, of the work that resembles the slavery, the work that is unrespectful to the environment so that we can overcome this reality in Brazil. We have 50,000 50 billion people in Brazil below the threshold of poverty. So we have to talk about dignity, legal work, not only the moral aspect of it, but also the social responsibility of the companies together with the individual social responsibility in order not to accept this backward movement in terms of society, in terms of politics and in terms of work. So Virginia, it's a pleasure to be here with you. So back to you. It's a very important moment when we are launching this book. So it's very important because the book is plural. It cuts across many areas, the working law, the right to work, the different slants of the work. So I would like to congratulate all of you and our network of research here. So thank you very much for being part of this group. Thank you very much, Gina, for all your support for this work to be published. I would just like to let you know that down 
at the screen, there is this button interpretation. So if you click on that button, you will be able to select the channel you would like to hear from because this event relies on simultaneous interpreting. So for our English speaking colleagues, you just have to click on interpretation, then on English. Interpretation. Then you have a room in Portuguese and a room in English. Okay. Uh, and let us know in the chat if you have any problem doing this. Thank you. Muito bem. Eu vou falar rapidamente aqui sobre. All right. So I am going to talk about our book. This book brings to Brazil this discussion triggered by the work manifesto that was written by Professor Dominica Medalhas Isabelle Ferreira, who's here with us today and Julie Batlana in 2020. So this manifesto stems from an issue that occupies our minds and reflections. How the sanitary, humanitarian, social and economic crisis unleashed by the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting the work world. So this manifest looks into this topic not based on the presupposition that there are changes that are inevitable, but rather from the perception that the way that the work is going, the world of the work will arise out of this pandemic will depend on choices that will be made now and choices that will be made collectively by society. So I think this is a very interesting aspect of the manifesto because it summons all of us to effect changes rather than just looking into a reality that would be inevitable. So it really makes us very responsible because based on this view, there are three values that are put forward by the manifesto that is part of the origin of the work law and they have to be reaffirmed. So democratize, decommodify and remedy. So the Brazilian book follows along those lines based on our reality, based on the perception of our own problems that come from our historic, social, political and economic reality that are within our own development. And the book in Professor Flavia's words has a decolonial view into all this discussion. So the idea is to open it up for all voices. And I would like to bring up an example of this reality during the pandemic, around 1 million and 600 domestic work workers lost their jobs in Brazil. And the workers, according to a student of mine, informally, they are essential and they had all their vulnerability exposed and they were exposed during this crisis. So this is an aspect the book brings along. So the work law has to take it seriously. The work of domestic works, poor works that are more often than not ruled out from the work law. So the book brings up important issues such as, for example, how to bring such principles to our reality, to the setting up of our workplace. Our workplace is marked by informality, precariousness, and vulnerability. So I think this is the greatest goal of this book, to trigger, spark off a discussion concerning a more inclusive law of work, the right of work that is connected to the Brazilian reality, to the Brazilian problems and reality. I think that during this pandemic, above all, the exclusion of informal workers revealed, undisclosed the reality, the raw reality of our country, which is not so resilient resilient to crisis. So we are on a difficult path to overcome problems brought about by the pandemic. So I hope that in today's discussion, we can start off this debate so that it is possible to create a permanent 
dialogue among all actors, but also a dialogue with our colleagues here in Brazil on how to change this work law that could really take care of all workers, both male and female, that were historically excluded from social protection in Brazil. All right, so I followed my, I respected my five minutes here, and now I would like to turn it over to Professor Flavia Maximo from the Federal University of Ouro Preto, who was our partner throughout this work well she was part of the initial group of the manifesto so it's a pleasure to have you here flavia good morning good afternoon good evening to all of you in mortifying political times in brazil it's a source of happiness to be united here with incredible women. This book, as all research must be, is the fruit of collective will that do not wish make the pre-pandemic workplace the reality or continuing the world that we have now this genocide that affects death not as a result of uh, being muffled, but also the necropolitics that operates in terms of race, gender, sexuality, and the origin of our working class. I would like to thank, first of all, the brilliant Professor Ana Virginia Gomes in the Fetcable that together with Professor Eduardo Dias made this book possible, CAPES PPGD Unifor, PPG UFOP, and everyone that made this meeting possible. And the researchers that started this movement that were very bold and with generosity put forward three compelling reasons instead of only pointing out to problems. Isabelle Ferreira, Julie Batilai, Dominique Meda. So thank you very much for giving us this uh, freedom and liberty to write about the limits and the power of principles democratize, decommodify, and remedy in our country. I also thank our Democratizing Work Research Network, Professors Adel Blackett and Ira, who inspired me as decolonial scholars and the Brazilian researchers, marvelous ones, that in a very short period of time submitted their papers, contextualizing the principles of the Southern life and Gabedu that made this cover and Paulo Savage, Leonardo da Cis that translated the manifesto into Portuguese. Yes, indeed, today we speak Portuguese. Despite what happens in most of the in most of the international events, we Brazilians speak our language today. Our language, there is nothing more contradictory than affirming our identity as southern working women we have to mimetize the, uh, the the tongue of our colonizer from the northern hemisphere so it comes from the coloniality of wisdom and knowledge so we brazilian researchers we have to deal with that every day so this ontological extractivism that turns into an epistemological extractivism as well as economic so the political analysis of the employment relationship is a symphony away from us that doesn't touch our working class and that's because there is a legal coloniality in the working law us from the southern hemisphere we reproduce a eurocentric labor law that the human in the workplace is made up from this anti-black anti-indigenous and anti-feminist weltanschauung so this is, is still a legal construction geared towards one single kind of a human context, the only one whose voice is heard as a discourse. And for that, no translation is needed. But I continue defending the translation of my address into Portuguese, just like I continue to defend the translation of this work relationship to the Brazilian reality, despite all contradictions. Why is that? Because 
translation is the procedure that allows for creating intelligibility among and between the different world experiences without hierarchies concerning knowledge because i believe in epistemological bridges and by creating epistemic bridges maybe eventually it will be able to subvert the ontological place in face of a humanity that deals with working women from the southern hemisphere who are black in their majority sustaining this value chain based on taking care of others and life so we white scholars we know we are privileged in this process of being subjected by modern colonial capitalism it may not seem like that but we hear it and we know how responsible we are when we listen to that so your voices through us so let's be a journey and who knows midway we are able to change or to shift the translation of this work place and in order to construct to build collectively this construction together i would like to invite the brilliant and perfect isabelle ferreira she's one of the co-authors of the manifest of work together with julie batilana and dominique meda so she's holds a master's degree from the Bruxelles. She's a universe. She's from the University of Louvain, and she works as an associate senior at the program Labor and Work Life in the Harvard University. She's a member of the Académie Royale de Belgique, and she published by the uh, publishing house of Cambridge the book "Firms as Political Entities: Saving Democracy Through Economic Bicameralism." Isabel, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Flavia. Can you hear me fine? Yes? Okay, good. Good to see you, everyone. Uh, it's so fantastic to um, be together to celebrate and launch this uh, new uh, book. I'm, I'm extremely pleased to be with you uh, today because this is an important moment for what has become uh, a movement that we are trying to sustain around democratizing work. Um, why is it important? I think it's particularly important because when we started to write this uh, text that was an op-ed that Julie Batilana uh, from Harvard University, Dominique Meda from Paris Dauphine, uh, and myself, we were in the middle of the first lockdown that was uh, April last year. And we really felt that as scholars working on working people, working on people's work experience, we really had to try to help societies to learn from this pandemic and from this crisis. And we wrote this text uh, for uh, in hope to have it published in uh, the newspaper Le Monde in France. And as we did that and submitted our text, the, the journalist uh, who was our contact at Le Monde told us that uh, he wouldn't be able to publish it immediately and that he would actually publish it on May the 16th, which was two weeks from that moment. And what happened in those two weeks is actually very uh, important we didn't realize at the time how important that was but what happened is that because we had that time in front of us and because we had the certainty that the op-ed would be published which is very like unusual usually you you send your op-ed to a newspaper and you hope that they're gonna publish it but in on our case our contact told us it's gonna be published on may 16 so we were sure about that and we emailed the text to first a few female colleagues because we wanted to know if what we were saying in that text was resonant to their own understanding of the crisis. And we first emailed female colleagues because we felt that as women are so disproportionately affected by the crisis, we wanted to uh, turn first to female scholars. 
And their response was extremely uh, positive. I would not say enthusiastic because this is not, I mean, what we're saying in the, in the text is not um, a source of enthusiasm. It's actually, uh, um, it's a source of indignation. It's that indeed we are not organized today in such a way that we respect the equality of each other's and that our economic structure really supports that commitment. So um, that response that we got was all positive. People were saying, yes, you're not saying crazy things. We actually believe the same things are true. And so all of a sudden, the text was shared through mailboxes from a mailbox to another and quickly going around the globe. And so in a few days, as we actually collected names of colleagues that I didn't know actually personally, um, uh, people were saying, we, we want to, to sign this text. We agree with these three principles. Uh, we had to set up a, you know, a page on, 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 on the internet for people to sign in because I was totally unable to, to process all those names which were coming in my, my mailbox. And what happened is that in two weeks, indeed, more than 3,000 3, scholars from around the, around the globe signed this text. And Olivier, who's uh, one of our uh, volunteer in this network, actually counted the origins of, of, the, of the people who signed. And we were more than 650 universities across the five continents. And that is a very um, a source of enthusiasm, of course. That is that was just so surprising and so amazing to actually um, get that understanding that these three basic principles are actually shared principle around the globe. And as we understood that, because the, 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 the text which turned to manifesto uh, was published in more than 35 newspapers, national media, thanks to the work of Alicia, of Lucas, other fantastic volunteers who, who really put their time to help this movement grow. We really understood that this was really three principles that the world wanted to reflect upon. And so today is a very important moment for us because as we try to nurture the movement and uh, wrote the book, the Le Manifeste Travail, which was published uh, in October by Le Seuil from Paris, uh, we did that a group of 12 female scholars who were in the movement from the beginning with Flavia was here, with Imge, whom I see, with Nira, who is here too, uh, from Delhi, Imge is in Madrid. Uh, so we are from around the globe. And we wrote that book in hope that it would nurture and sustain the movement. And so today is a very important moment because this is the first time that we are actually moving to another level, which is that these principles and the book has been read and reflected upon from another place, uh, uh, yet another place across the globe, which is Brazil. And Flavia actually came with the idea that we should invite other new researchers to also write about the principles so that they can reflect on uh, the importance of the principles, but also to anchor them in the realities of societies um, and here in, in, in the reality of Brazil. And we found that was exactly what we wanted. We don't think that these principles are owned by anyone. They are actually basic principles that sustain the equality of human beings and their and the dignity of workers. And it's up for all societies 
to reflect about how in the context of their own economic structures, these principles ought to be experienced and lived up and advanced. So today is a really uh, uh, great moment and I look forward to hear from all of you because I, 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 I cannot say I read the book because I don't read Portuguese, unfortunately, but Flavia told me uh, about what was in the book, but it's the first time we personally meet, we e-meet, obviously. Uh, and um, I really look forward to hearing from all your thoughts and contributions. And what's really core, I think, for us is really that you are like the embodiment that these principles are principles that resonate around the globe and that they need to be nurtured in the conditions, in the context um, uh, that are um, living context. So thank you. Thank you to uh, Flavia, who uh, took that project from the beginning on and who has done a tremendous uh, work to make it uh, exist. Thank you, obviously, to Anna Virginia Gomez, who has been a, a fantastic sponsor and a fantastic believer in this project, uh, who put her, her, her mind our, our academic skills in making it possible. And we also join forces with Eduardo Rocha Diaz. Thank you so much, Eduardo, also to have joined forces to assemble this extra group of other scholars weighing on these principles. So I guess I should also thank you, uh, thank CAPES, the Brazilian Public Foundation, who actually makes it possible for the book to be uh, available freely, which is actually fabulous because we really believe in open source and in open science. And we, we think that as scholars, we ought to uh, put our knowledge in the service of society. This is what we tried to achieve by um, uh, sharing this, these three principles as a way to understand what we should learn from this crisis. But as you publish this book, you are really deepening that commitment. And this is really fantastic. So I look forward to hearing from all your contributions. Thank you very much. Bem, uh, muito obrigada, professor Isabel, professor Flavia. Thank you very much, Isabelle. Our idea is that each co-author has the floor to speak about their contribution, and after that, we have a debate. So we're going to start with Professor Renata Kedutra, a law professor from the Brazilian University that uh, addressed the D mercantilization process. Good morning, Ana Virginia. Thank you very much. I would like to thank for the opportunity to participate in this powerful project, this international network that was built around the manifesto. Uh, the opportunity to dialogue with so many scholars. And uh, I would like to to speak with all the admirable women that are here today. And uh, I would like uh, to thank Flavia Maximo, our dear colleague that challenged us in many ways recently. Thank you, Ana Virginia, who organizes this with us. And also, I thank you, everyone. I addressed in my article specifically the decommodifying of work because it's important to to talk about it with this paradigm of uh, as the law work last year last century that constitutes uh, 
consegue perceber uma elevação. So we are able to understand an elevation of the temperature of the social conflicts and the need of constituting and of recognizing based on the capitalist system the limits to the process of work over exploitation and based on this need and based on the social movements there is this juridical legal political paradigm of protection to work based on the idea that the human work cannot be deemed a merchandise so this affirmation is as deep as it is contradictory because when it deals with labor law contradictorily it implies the conservation of the exploitation of work and it also points to the resignification of work at the same time that it legitimates the exploitation of work it acknowledges that there should be limits to this process of exploitation in order not to degrade our society so this paradigm that is centered on mercantilization on the commodification or the spirit of philadelphia as a scholar said it seemed to be a consensus in terms of protection of work at least from a certain point of view so the recent changes the capitalist system has gone through and the changes of the liberal legal and political system and the productive restructuration makes this paradigm be called into question first in a closed manner then overtly in a very open kind of criticism so if in the beginning we had this idea of the commodification of work based on subterfuge or frauds nowadays there is an open discourse that calls into question this non-mercadological issue of the human work and it challenges overtly the possibility of people working individually based on the market rules and without any kind of protection so this manifesto turns into a, a duty for anyone who defends this idea that the human work is not a merchandise in itself but my text provokes and here i abide by the challenge of being a researcher from a southern hemisphere country as it is stated this perspective of the commodification it seems to places in an impasse right because we have to deny the neoliberal perspective but there are challenges from this legal paradigm of protection that wanted to be universal but it was based on premises that didn't dialogue with the constitutive conditions of the workplace in brazil and such conditions are based on elements of slavery of a colonized country so elements that are stemming from a global context where women are made vulnerable and are not considered in their workplace experiences so based on the challenges we face in brazil based on the work or the labor reforms that we've just gone through we have to summon the population to defend to advocate for a protection paradigm that should be involved in face of the neoliberal threat this paradigm has also to be enhanced or even reinvented so that it can have a dialogue with the informal work with the racial issues of our workplace with the reminiscence of the slavery process that after all can think of the black women as subjects in this paradigm and i am happy to count upon research from a new generation of researchers of labor law in brazil who have challenged such issues so decolonization pedro nicole flavia who think 
care who think the centrality of the work care and uh, Stella, who we are going to listen to, Santana, who think racism in workplace and so on and so forth. So I think that our challenge is to defend a paradigm of production that is willing to be reinvented and enhanced. So I would like to thank for this opportunity and I am at your availability for the debate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Sir Renata Dutra, so very thought provoking in your speech. Now I would like to turn it over to Professor Stella Vieira, professor of the postgraduate program in the Federal University of Western Santa Catarina State, that is part of our PPGD here in UNIFOR. And in her paper, she also touched upon issues of care. So, Professor Regina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Ana Virginia. Good morning. Good morning, every one of you, at least here in Brazil, it's good morning. So I'd like to start off by highlighting the importance of the manifesto and the grandeur of this global articulation that was put into work, into movement during pandemic times i would like to thank isabelle Ferreira, who is here on behalf of all the other authors so thank you very much and i would like to thank the organizers flavia mas manager Gina gomez the organizers of the book for being since in the beginning of the project for the effort of translating and publishing it in brazil and also for being here participating in this talk with such a distinguished audience and panel so i would like to thank Renata also who spoke before me it's always good to share virtual spaces with all of you feminist greetings to all of you who watch us so very briefly i'd like to talk about the text that is up to me it is we've bled too much so pandemic and the commodification of work and labor law so the proposal made by flavia and nana virginia to us authors of the brazilian version is that we could reflect upon a sentence of the manifesto and bring in our contributions from the southern hemisphere as Renata and nana virginia have already stated so the sentence is human health and care of the most vulnerable can to be ruled over only by market forces. So the sentence has a context, the COVID-19 pandemic, as Isabelle has already pointed out, which has deepened and made open several social problems. The fear of an unknown disease exposed the human vulnerability and our sociability. F France's president, he said how he was mistaken given the response to the pandemic. So the pandemic confronted the neoliberal individualism and made it clear that classifying some groups as dependent means hiding that dependence is inherent to all people who have always demanded care, which is more or less intense throughout lifetime. So care is a key concept and a path to action to conserve humanity. So not only care in the private space, but also care as a public and collective responsibility. So we have the emergency bailout or the importance of the public health care with uh, universal access, as we have here in Brazil. My reflections in the text had as the starting point care, which is my research subject over the last eight years. As the manifesto didn't deal with this domestic work of care directly, I decided to bring it to light and to shed light to it, which is fundamental to all of us because care has to do with race, gender and class. There is an intimate relationship between care and inequalities. So it is more and more noticeable during pandemic. So domestic workers and caretakers, caregivers, as Professor Virginia said, they had to run risks, run risks for their lives and the lives of their families to keep make money and many of them lost their income in the most significant case that took place in Pernambuco 
so a mother, domestic worker, saw her kid dying in a tragic accident because she had to take her kid to her employer's home. So it demands breaking with the chains of capitalism and the structures of capitalism has to do with the difficulty of recognizing the collective responsibility for care it depends on individuals on the state on the civil society as well as the imposition of this to certain social groups it serves as a mechanism of oppression and exploitation so as i have to be brief here i would like to invite all of you to read the text i wrote that all authors wrote, read the manifesto once and again. I would say that this is an essential work for today's world and for labor law, which is mine and yours area. And as the title says, and also Bequior, who's a Brazilian singer and songwriter, we've bled too much. And how to heal? Caring and care reveals interdependence between human beings, between Northern and Southern hemispheres, between those who are in and out of the segregation lines, allowing us to talk about shared humanities responsibilities. That's it, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. I would just like to close it here. All right. Okay. Can you listen to me? Yep. So we are going to continue. So we turn it over to Maria Neiva Gomes, professor at the higher university level, higher education level, Federal University of Minas Gerais. Professor Maíra wrote a very interesting paper on the issue of the illicit activities and racial discrimination in Brazil. Professor Maíra. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you and be able to see some faces that I only see the names written. So these opportunities are, are something new. They even frighten us somehow, but they are totally significant and important because in this virtual prison that we need to deepen our relationship to integrate all these courses for resistance. It's not a common narrative because not all are equal. Each one has their particularities, but uh, I hope we can promote the hearing, the dialogue, and somehow social media take it from us because they standardize some discourses and the voices that are trying to uh, enter in the social tissue. Thank you, Professor Flavia Massimo, for the invitation, and Professor Ana Virginia, that finally I meet. Uh, I hear about you a lot, and this uh, acknowledgement is special because, in a way, I am using here a uh, space of speech because I am a black woman, and uh, nowadays it is fashion, so I am uh, taking profit of fashion to, to make my voice heard. Uh, but also to help black Brazilian men who live in favelas. And this black man is seen by all social movements in Brazil as a social enemy, not only by the institutionalized power as an enemy, but unfortunately, reproduce this idea that the black body is something threatening because supposedly it is violent and it doesn't reflect reality that we experience here in the brazilian favelas uh, no about it in an abstract way because each territory has their own identity and uh, 
de organização. With its option, we cannot talk about favelas as the European idea because in that way we would not understand how are these territorial organizations that happen in Brazil that they inherit the I adopt the academic conception that Brazilian favelas are a continuation of that were resistant territories against uh, slavery and colonization. I understand favelas like that, but each of them has their own organization. And we must reflect how this interaction is done here in, for example, we have an ethnical composition predominantly with black people, but some people are indigenous as well. And this brings a way of organizing very peculiar that doesn't uh, leave the slavery situation. So how I understand the black man as my partner, partner in the favela territory is like that, because the way of organizing the social relationship in, under, in a segregated territory and threatened territory is different. Here, the black man is our social partner. And we, women, many times should use those spaces that are given to us socially as a concession. The black woman has a space only if they speak about something specific, but we should understand how uh, things should happen with the subject. And the pandemic revealed here in Brazil, not only the intensification of these works that continue being non analogous to slavery, but actually slavery itself, because we only change the ways of submission and exploitation of these people. But many times we forget about essential things. Economically, the Brazilian favelas depend on commercialization of drugs, illegal drugs. We don't have a in Brazil regarding these data because we researchers are always threatened by the state apparatus, the police, for example, when we try to implement some research projects so that we could understand better the dimension of the economical impact of drug commercialization. So for me, what remains is some uh, reports published by Brazilian journalists, and I used in my text the reference uh, a story from a businessman in the drug traffic in Rio, where he talks about these organizations because I was not able to use the material that I could collect myself. So uh, that's the way how we can do things. We cannot study things and understand things because the state does not allow us to. So I came here to bring you some reflections uh, not only in the imprisonment point of view, uh, the commercialization of drugs, which was a policy that was deepened in Brazil during the Lula administration, when he makes the drug commercialization uh, a very high uh, illicit and then more people go to prison because of that and the commercialization of drugs makes that black men go to prison Martin. and now the data is a little bit changed because the imprisonment of women who work in the commercialization of drugs increases a lot which catches the attention to some other researchers. So 
finally, what we have to use is the legitimacy that we black women have, even if partially, to be able to speak for those more than 700,000 black men imprisoned in Brazil. Why is it important to talk about that? Professor, it's very interesting. I would not like to interrupt you. I also would like to comment, but we have to conclude because our time is limited, okay? So uh, I'm going to conclude. Well, this is very important. In the territory government that I experienced in Brazil, we cannot name it. But in this moment, Anvisa published in December 2019, uh, authorized the importation and exportation of cannabidiol in Brazil. And this cannabidiol comes to the market 100 milliliters for 2,000 highs. It is 2,000 times more expensive than in the illegal commerce. So the Supreme Court in Brazil made a decision that if there is the need for a patient to use that, the court will allow. And there is another economical impact. It is it fair to pay this price imposed by the industry, but we have to advance the debate on legalization not only in the medical aspect, but also discuss, discussing about the psychological effects and other kinds of drugs and the economical need of favela to use this commercialization because it did not stop. It is accentuated in the pandemic and our worry is very big because favelas will be more violent and will be more unequal, but also the hypocrisy of the Brazilian state. It's not a secret the political elites in Brazil control and monopolize drug traffic. This is published even in the world press. So my work is about that. I'm not given a solution, but I'm proposing an through the analytics to understand the regulation of drug commercialization in Brazil from practice, because there are labor norms, commerce norms that were adopted by favelas and adapted. We should understand that before elaborating a discourse that brings the problems of uh, mental Incluindo drug também. use, and also concluding about the economic and labor perspective. That's it. Thank you very much, Professor Marília. It's very interesting. And now I pass the floor to Professor Fernanda Barreira. Uh, she is a doctor in law in the University of Pernambuco. She talked about the of labor relationships. It's an essential subject when we think about informal work and where the limitations of labor law is. Professor Fernanda, please. So Professor Fernanda had a health issue and unfortunately, Professor Fernanda, she won't be able to she join us. She had a health problem today, so she is not able to be here. So I'm going to pass the floor to Professor Valdeci. She works in the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. Professor Valdeci, please. Professor Valdeci. Professor Valdeci. I saw Professor Valdetti is here indeed. Yes, she said that she was having issues with her connection, technical glitches. So we're going to turn it over to Professor Luisa, right? Yes, indeed. Would you like to introduce her? Professor Luisa Chari, who's a professor at 
the College London member of London Business School. She's our invitee who carried out an analysis of all papers and who wrote uh, the preface to the book. So, Professor Chari, please feel free to floor is yours. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. So, thank you very much for the invitation. Today, I am an imposter here at this virtual meeting. First, because I am not one of the authors, as Flavia has just said, but I had the privilege of reading all papers and I wrote today's brief introduction to them. And secondly, because I'm going to talk about decolonization, even if I am a Brazilian who lives in the Northern Hemisphere. So I apologize for being in this ambiguous situation but I was born in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, so it maybe gives me some authority into this issue. Anyways, it's difficult to collect, to conjure up the right words, given the situation we are going through in Brazil, most particularly. So Brazil has been setting a terrible example. We've surpassed 300,000 deaths according to official statistics, which we unfortunately know that they are under notified. In this context and in this manifesto, both the original and the Brazilian version, it was a very important work to call attention to this problem in the world of labor relations. As all authors have stated, well, not all of them are here, but as all have written in their respective chapters, what we are seeing today, given the catastrophe brought about by the pandemic in the workplace worldwide, it's not a novelty, actually. It is just being more stunning more baffling, but there is this vulnerability, inequalities, several ways of oppressions that were here indeed before the pandemic. So I think this manifest and the Brazilian version most particularly invite us to rethink the concept of work itself, of labor. What is work and who is a worker? Who has this right and privilege of being considered or not a worker? What kind of activities can be deemed by labor law and social protection as being an occupation? So as many have already stated, the crucial tasks to our survival, food production, care, cleaning, healthcare workers, they are the ones that suffer from precariousness the most, and they are exposed to the risks of the pandemic. They are the Uber, the Uber driver, delivery workers, caretakers, and they are under violent labor relations using ILO's works. They are unprotected, but we hope they continue work during pandemic times. In Brazil, we have this particularity of having the Brazilian labor law code, CLT. Up until 2017, it was a very complete code with a very wide care system compared to the French system, actually. So with norms that are really developed for a southern hemisphere country, but 40% of the workforce is informal. It means that the labor law isn't applied to almost half of the workforce. So this is something that we have to take into account when it comes to decolonization. The excluded groups, I mean, the ones that haven't even entered the CLT, the rural workers and the domestic workers, that in the first version of the CLT in 1943 weren't there, they were by law excluded. It was written that both groups couldn't be included in the text. They are the ones where we had more black workers 
and uh, freed workers right after slavery. They, they continued working in plantations and some of them went to this kind of jobs. So we have to think of this colonial roots of our system. Labor law will end up determining who can be included or not. And we have to think about the consequences of such an issue. And in the Brazilian reality, it's crucial not having social protection in Brazil nowadays, not having the right to access to the basic needs. It means that workers have to choose between being contaminated, being contaminated or being hungry. So the ones that sell their products on the street, they have no access to unemployment, security benefits, or any other kind of uh, social care. So either they run the risk of catching uh, COVID-19 or they starve. I won't even talk about these emergency income that is given by the government, but uh, we can look into it later. But as it was asked concerning decolonization, here are some elements that we can take on later on. But uh, picking up some of them, this is slavery legacy. We have to recognize, to acknowledge the presupposition in law, in social practices, who's the worker, who's not the worker, what means a qualified work, why we use this term in the scholarly world, and also in the daily life, we talk about qualified and non-qualified. Who's the non-qualified? How we could reverse this logic entirely so that we can achieve the goals of democratization and decommodification. So the Brazilian legislation makes it clear that it's not possible to think of decommodify and democratize without decolonizing first. And what I would like to state, first of all, here, because I had most of my lifetime in France and England, we have to stop using northern countries as models. In many things, they are not. And in labor law, countries such as the US and England, there are no model of social protection. There are no model to be applied anywhere, even more so in England, for example they had this invasion of um, zero hours contract so it allows people to be called upon from one week to the other so the person will never know how long the person will work and uh, how much money the person will make so not everything that comes from the north is good not everything that glitters is gold so for example an illegal immigrant in france or england in many aspects sometimes they are even worse at worse conditions than illegal or unregistered workers in Brazil. So the uh, illegal workers, sans papier in France, for example, they don't speak the language, they are in very precarious situations. So this precariousness that we see here and in Brazil, it also exists in northern countries and i would like just to make one more comment concerning the uk two weeks ago the which is a uh, right-wing populist government announced a uh, cut of 120 million pounds in terms of research and aid to the uh, third world and it to the developing world and it was a shock because it was a cut that came out of the blue and that will threatened the uh, employment of 2,000 researchers. And there was a paper, an article published at The Guardian saying that it happens in Brazil, not in the UK. <laughs> so to think, because it also happens there, this neoliberalism also practices this kind of violence during pandemic times. And to wrap up, I think that the contributions of the manifest makes us think that the dignity of the worker of the human life well beyond the workplace we have to think of our right to being alive in any kind of circumstance even more so in crisis and we have to detach what we do to our merit in the workplace our right to be in human citizens to be alive and with health 
So we have to think of alternative ways to protect population, even more so when we talk about this universal basic income and other forms of protecting people beyond the working relations, right? So please read the book, sign the manifest and uh, share it far and wide. Let's think of all this in order to protect the human being in regardless of being a worker or not. Thank you very much, Luisa. Thank you very much for contributing to our project. And now I would like to turn it over to Professor Valdete Severo. She holds a PhD in labor law. She's a professor in the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul who touched upon this issue. I remember a sentence of her paper that fear is the main feeling of the worker in this working relationship, Professor Valdete. Thank you, Ana. So, first of all, I would like to say that it is very good to be here among all of you. It's nice to see Renata, Flavia, Regina, and having been invited to participate in such a powerful manifesto is a compelling force during or amid pandemic crisis. Everything has been very demanding, right? I've written in the chat here, Fernanda said that she's not able to speak because she has COVID. And reading her statement and knowing that there are so many people that is hospitalized, it is a pain. It's painful that really turn us apart, so tears apart. That's why it's important to have this feminist view. It's something that's of utmost importance. And I am very grateful for being here. As Anna said, I wanted to talk about this sentence, de-commodifying work and assuring work for everyone. Because in my view, as I listened to Regina, who is a reference, right? Her writings on care and uh, working care. It's something that, ha that I have researched for a long time since my beginning as a scholar or as a judge in labor law. So a country that is based on capital and the capitalist systems, we have to protect against being made redundant because during a pandemic, a country as Brazil that without a doubt is cut across by this colonial condition, patriarchal per per peripheral condition. So this fight against unemployment even facilitates being hired because there were provisional legal measures adopting other strategies not to face the pandemic. They end up facilitating hiring people collectively as the labor reform from 2017 make possible. It's even more important to have this kind of manifesto, this attempt to decommodify work. It's a radical proposition because we know very well that in a capitalist environment, there is no possibility of decommodifying entirely because people are turned into things people have to sell themselves in order to buy food and to keep themselves healthy so an important step within the capitalist logic to start thinking of decommodifying work is to acknowledge the central importance of this protection against being hired, not even talking about the Article 7 of our Constitution that ensures this employment relationship against being hired. It hasn't been applied. It has been solemnly ignored over the last 30 years. I'm talking about going beyond. I'm talking about reforms to take out the stability of civil servants. If we want to talk about the decommodification of work, we have to talk about stability of all of those who depend on work to survive. So we have to protect against being hired, the logic of stability that is the only one that caters to the stability of the system, which has to do with having people able to consume at the mid and long term. Nowadays in the Brazilian, reality we have a structural unemployment that affects 14 million people and a complete lack of stability so we don't have even this constitutional guarantee against being fired that's what i said anna this paper that's part of the manifesto the main feeling that mobilizes workers both male and female even if we weren't in pandemic times is fear 
because we don't know who work in the private conditions. They are not able to know if they are continue working or not on the following day. And they are not sure if they are going to be able to pay their bills, if their kids are going to eat or not. So it seems to be uh, at the core of what we are proposing here at the manifesto so that we can claim immediately this logic against being fired is reversed in Brazil. So we can't even talk about labor law or labor rights in a framework where there are no minimum guarantees against being fired. So when we hear about CLT being too protective, too many rights, I think, well, what kind of reality people are addressing here? Because in reality, there is no protection against being fired. And if there is not such a right, people will be harassed, women will be discriminated, will be paid less, simply because there is no choice. There are 14 million people without a job in Brazil. So my contribution and thanking you for the opportunity for being a part of this network of women powerful enough to revolutionize the world so that we should reflect on the importance of effectively protecting people against being fired, not only amid pandemic times, but even in a reality in the of reality as a way for working or for ensuring this the decommodification. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Valdete. Thank you very much. Our contribution is very important. I would like to turn it over to Professor Jacqueline Gomes de Jesus. She is a psychology professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, who touched upon different topics in her paper concerning democratization. Professor Jacqueline. Thank you very much. I would like to greet the dear Flavia, who invited me, everyone here. And I also see Professor, my new friend. I greet you from Rio, from the center of chaos and death and resistance, because that's what we here in this country for centuries now. And I'm very glad and honored to be here colleagues, you are very powerful. You are so capable to transform. And this is what is the value of this work, to have this fire for transformation and not only to complement our curriculum. I believe that. So in my article, in my chapter, it was very, very Todas, eu sinto sempre um gosto de. I feel always that there's something incomplete and I want something more. I think that it points out to some ways that are very interesting to reflect about. And they are part of a trajectory that I have already uh, followed throughout my personal life. but throughout my academic life. And uh, I was thinking about discussing the idea of a democratization from a reflection about machoism, homophobia, but thinking about this dialogue between what we understand by discrimination and the oppressions that structure us above all. So. I started this work from a proverbium that follows me from my master's degree, a saying that says that uh, the waters, uh, the stones in the water don't know the sufferings of the stones under the sun. So I ask some questions to you regarding these workers we are talking about are the pains of these women, which are their sexual orientation. Are they considered really men and women? Are they native from the region where they work or are they immigrants? What constructs their nationalities? 
so this topic is very interesting for me and my colleagues have also brought to me some of these flows that mark us and i would like just to think about this uh, topic flavia talked about uh as as passengers in life uh, but where are we going this is a challenge i don't believe that we are in a re-democratization process i have never believed in a democracy in this country because there, there is a structure that must finish we have already seen some apocalypses um, and in my text i talked about a look that comes from Leila Gonzalez, that dialogues with all the experience of our ancestors, the African indigenous experience, that questions today this non-nominated so far heteros system. Okay. So this is a system, cis gender technology for the maintenance of a patriarchic worldview that needs to build this universal subject that uh, something particular we are talking about as writers, thinkers, workers. Okay. That is the white man that supposedly is Straight, this universal subject that we are talking about and trying to understand, but mainly looking to those who escape this norm and thinking about the end of this norm. Not that we have to finish men, but we have to rethink this structure that privileges this main subject. Eu falo... so this is the big challenge of this work. I speak about a place that uh, brings what Jurema vem de longe. Eu saúdo vocês neste dia de Oxalá. I salute you in the day of Oxalá. It's the day of Axé. Para falar de uma paciência. To talk about a patient and the generosity that's very big in this country that lives this schizophrenia. I, I like to re-elaborate the levels of analysis. I keep bringing things from the individual to the collective levels because the Brazilian society is traumatized and we elect neo-Nazis to power and genocide Man, this is Brazil we're talking about today. And that is being passive, Brazil. We think we need another human technology. We need to rethink these ways. And uh, thinking about work, I thought a lot about it. And uh, when I read it, I mentioned the invis invisibility of this diversity in this work body. It's very useful. I, I, I talked about another researcher and it's useful for capital or for people who concentrate capital that this comprehension uh, that neoliberal that we we produce some kind of representation for each box and then the problem is solved. But the challenge is to understand how this workforce and the intellectual workforce that predominantly is white and straight in sexual orientation, how can it represent this diversity? Not only as an interesting subject, but and people who produce content and the transgender uh, technology I, I will think about brazil before portugal we had even uh, 
the possibility of existence. When we were talking about assassination or rape or things like that. So this reference for the fight of transgender people, not for the right of uh, person of work. We talk about labor reformation and transgender people do not have that right. We're talking about children who are 13 years old and they are kicked out of home and they work as sex slavers and they are exploited by men who have family. But despite all that, they were able to have a dignified life. In Portugal, and in the Inquisition, 1520, there was a denunciation of a transgender in the 16th century. And now in Brazil, when we Chica Manicomo, she is denounced in the Inquisition because she uh, wore African clothes. So their names were modified even. And Chica Manicongo didn't have that name in Congo. So we're talking about the right to have a name. Uh, how many of us think about Dami Satan, uh, a very famous transgender? Who thinks about the construction of this identity of these women occupying their spaces more and more in politics? Yesterday, uh, politics women, my friend was threatened or violent because she was transgender. And that in the, the chamber, the legislative power. So they should be recognized by the vote, by a part of population. So if that happens, we are re-democratizing for whom? This is the challenge. Excuse me, but uh, we have to follow our time, okay? Okay, let's conclude. To conclude, the big question is, no, we're not talking about remedy or rep democratization, but we need a cure. And that's what I believe in. That's why I participate in this book. And the, the, the book follows this path. We wish you all the best. Even in the virtual world, we can transform it beyond our screens. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone. It was spectacular. It's great to have this space to exchange some ideas. And now I would like to open for comments, observation from the professors, co-authors, but also anyone who is here in our audience. If you want to open your, I can start very quickly. And then I, I have uh, written down some aspects that are related to what I researched, what uh, Professor Maida brought, the drugs, and also the workers on the streets. It's a part of workers who are not very much studied because they work on the streets and they have a very specific relationship with drugs which in Brazil is very strong. So for example, here in Fortaleza, we study the street workers who collect garbage. And we should think about different people and how the informality is heterogeneous in itself. And the labor law has this way of uh, simply calling them informal workers, but they are so many in different different ages. And also there's the, the question of re-democratization and how this is a determining factor in the case of 
workers who are outside of labor law. Encourage how these workers and their collectivity is impressive. They organize themselves for a way to improve their work environment. And labor law cannot affirm with all the letters and put all its uh, protection for their freedom to be a collectivity, the dialogue so that their voices are heard for the right to action. So without the reflection of how this may be done in this uh, so-called informality, that's a significant part and very big part of our workers. So it's very interesting as well, the question by Luisa, what is work? which kinds of work uh, deserve protection. So we have to reflect about that. So in my experience, uh, in the research that I, I do with uh, garbage collectors, I was very frustrated because labor law did not provide any answer for their work. So I think it's very good to hear you and think that we can continue working, researching and planning so that this is different in the future. Flav, I don't know if you want to make some remarks. Well, actually, I would like to thank all of those who are here and the author who contributed to this powerful book as everyone has already mentioned Isabelle Julien Dominique had the guts of putting forward these issues and we translated it into this uh, different geopolitics of knowledge in a decolonization effort for the Brazilian reality. So I am going to open it up for the debate. So if anyone would like to make remarks or to make questions, we're here. If authors and Isabelle want to uh, voice up their ideas, so it's open for the debate. May, may I speak? I don't interrupt anyone. No, that's okay. Okay. Uh, thank you so much uh, to uh, all of you for um, your um, presentation and sharing. It was uh, extremely um, powerful to uh, see all the uh, important points that you have been able to raise in connection to uh, the manifesto. And I think that's what really uh, is the most inspiring to me is to see that this is a conversation that should happen and that with the manifesto, we have apparently a way to make happen. And so that is terribly encouraging because obviously uh, we can really feel the the importance of the moment the 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 weight of the crisis at this moment especially in brazil and that is or that could almost uh, uh freeze us right because this is so uh consequential but uh indeed with engaging with the discussion about the three principles um uh, we have as researchers, I think, a tool to engage and to uh, nurture the conversation. I wanted maybe to make uh, two, two points, to, 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 to raise two points, um, to add to the, 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 the discussion. I think one important uh, um, 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 avenue forward is going to be the um, the linkages that we managed to build between the three principles. Because what we uh, really need to uh, be able to envision is how 
actually these three principles uh, work with each, each other. Uh, or another way to put it is to say that these principles have been available uh, in history in the, uh, let's say, in the, the stock of ideas of humanity um, for a very long time. But maybe today what is um, original or what's the original contribution that we are making together is to see that these principles will work together or will fail together. But there is no way we can make progress on one principle if we don't care for making progress on the two others. And that I think uh, to me is a constant, um, is a constant uh, uh, preoccupation and um, and uh, as we work on work, we really see that demo de de democratizing work will have no effect structurally if it is not uh, decommodifying at the same time. And if we don't care for decommodifying at the same time and remediating the environment. Um, so on that point, I wanted to um, uh, point to one proposal in the manifesto that uh, we have uh, only touched uh, upon, uh, which is uh, the proposal of the job guarantee. I understand that in the context of Brazil, a uh, proposal of a universal job guarantee might uh, become, might, might be seen completely uh, uh, unrealistic because uh, as we um, as we we discussed, there is no guarantee against being fired. So just that very basic minimum in labor law is not there for so many workers. Uh, but when you take uh, into consideration the fact that 14 million people are without a job in Brazil and need uh, a job, the proposal of the job guarantee as a way to, at the same time, decommodify labor and address the problem of caring for each other and caring for the planet is a powerful uh, policy uh, tool. And so um, I wanted to get your um, attention to that chapter which is uh, available in the in the in the book by Pavlina Cherneva who which I think could be an interesting um, uh, um, an interesting um, a proposal upon which to build up all the points uh, all the critical points that you've raised but give it um, give it, I would say, an intention or give it an intentionality in terms of politics. Thank you. Muito obrigada, Isabelle. Thank you very much, Isabelle. Any other person would like to make a question or a comment? Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I hope not to be interrupting the talk of the other authors, I would like to say that I was here following all the lectures. I would like to know if Lizia Herzog is among us because she has a very interesting paper on the guarantee and dignity of everyone and the action collectively to remedy and save the planet. I thought it was very interesting. And along the lines of uh, Professor Isabelle Ferreira, I think that having this anthropocentric and the transition to the planet centric vision taking into account labor relationships is crucial i think it's very important what the human dignity means taking into consideration that human dignity made a divorce between what's human and the exclusion of women, planet, the foreigners, and the universe of labor relations. When we talk about human dignity, and here for over 32 years, we've been talking about the 1988 constitution, we can see that most of the population in Brazil and worldwide is excluded 
when it comes to the defense of human dignity among them, women, the planet, foreigners, children, and now the minorities that were brought up here. Actually, they are not minorities, they are the majority. And as professor of environmental law, C professor Anna Virginia, we have to take into account the debt of reason. And he talked about that. All these problems can be surpassed at the courts with economic or political decisions, but our debt towards nature persists. And it's important to take into account that our view can't be anthropocentric only. So that's why uh, Professor Zerzog paper is very interesting. And there you go, this provocation. I would like to listen to her. I don't know if she's present here, but I would like to hear from you. How can we conciliate planet, profits, people and work? because forgetting the planet is no longer possible in this legal and juridical view that is too much anthropocentric. And thank you very much for being here. I am very satisfied of having listened to all of you and to be part of this group. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Gina, Professor Eduardo. Good morning, good afternoon. Can you listen to me? So first of all, Professor Virginia, I would like to highlight that Professor Isabel Ferreras has just said that uh, Professor Lizer Zog, the author, is not here among us. So I would like to thank the opportunity of getting to know personally or better, at least through this computer screen, the authors, Professor Isabel Ferreiras, Professor uh, Massimo Virginia, and many of you who are here. I had the privilege of participating in the organization of this book. And a bit, you know, along the lines of what the Isabel Ferreira's address and Professor Gina's talk, this concrete issue of connecting this connection between access to a dignifying work. This is the research that Professor Virginia and I carry out concerning garbage collectors, because here we have a kind of occupation that is framed as an informal occupation or a precarious kind of work, but at the same time, it has the potential of generating income as well as improving the environment. So it may lead to a better environment protection given the recycling mindset. So here there is a potentially concrete field according to which we can not only improve labor relations, but also increase income, either by means of the association of garbage collectors in associations or co-ops, or even through a better payment to the residues and waste and garbage that are collected. Also, it is an opportunity to remedy the environment, so it can spark off a discussion on how we consume, how we eliminate residues and waste. On the other hand, I would like to highlight an important aspect, which is the need in given the pandemic context of ensuring a minimum income so that people can have some social distancing, some isolation in order to minimize the impact over the healthcare system. This impact that has already claimed over 300,000 Brazilian lives. So a debate on the emergence government income, and even a debate on the basic income given by the government that may not be universal necessarily, but that could include informal workers that the pandemic made evident that they were 
uh, the margin of the mechanisms of social protection that are existent. So I think that it is an opportunity to debate and I am very happy to having been able to listen to all professors and bring up these issues to the debate. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you very much, Flavia. Thank you very much to all the authors present. Thank you very much. And uh, a final declaration about environment in this context of in injustice, we observe that informal worker so suffer more and more intensively the burden of 